Welcome everybody to CRS Virtual Education. Um, we are recording the session and uh, playing live on Sir John as well. Tonight we have joining us um, Dr. Suriano, who um, I am happy to introduce is gonna be talking with us about uh, ergonomics and colorectal surgery. Um, he is an associate professor and director of robotic surgery uh, in the Department of Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. He's also chair of the education committee of the Society of Surgical Ergonomics. He completed a combined undergrad and medical school program at the University of the Philippines, trained in general surgery at Mount Sinai in New York and Einstein Medical Center, um, and uh, followed by a fellowship in MIS and bariatric surgery at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Prior to coming to San Francisco, he was chief of uh, gastrointestinal surgery and surgeon, uh, surgeon champion of ACS NISQIP at Pennsylvania Hospital, as well as associate professor of clinical surgery at Perelman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania Health System. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and was awarded honorary fellow of both the Philippine College of Surgeons and Philippine Association of Laparoscopic and Endoscopic Surgeons. Um, and so with that, we'll let you take it away, Dr. Soriano. Uh, thanks so much, Gabby. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, for those on the West Coast, it's uh, mid-afternoon on Sunday, and uh, hopefully we can get you guys out uh, to dinner pretty soon. Uh, I'm just going to share the screen, and uh, let me check, make sure everyone sees it, and switch to this view. All right, is everyone seeing this now? Are we good, Gabby? All right. Yep, good to go. Excellent. So I know I probably won't be able to see a show of hands, but uh, uh, as fellows now, having finished uh, anywhere from five to seven, maybe eight years of general surgery uh, residency and about uh, a couple of months into your fellowship, <clears throat> I was wondering, uh, just think to yourself, ask the question, how many times have you felt aches, soreness, or pain at the end of your OR day in your neck? back, shoulders, or wrists. <clears throat> and I was really hoping I'd be able to see a show of hands, but at least, uh, you know, just think about this as you are going through this talk today. And hopefully uh, at the end of each week, think about this and hopefully that number will go down uh, with each week. And then second more important question, I guess, is how many of you stretch or exercise? <clears throat> before cases, at the start of the day, at the end of the day, after cases, between cases, and also at night. And finally, on weekends. And I think it is important to know that, you know, as, as surgeons, we try to have a good, as you say, work and life balance. But it is important to, I think, recognize that a lot of what we do in our lives on weekends, uh, after the day, uh, especially in terms of exercise and being active, can affect our performance in the operating room. <clears throat> and that is why I think uh, when I was being asked to give this talk, I thought it was talk important to talk about, you know, post-op pain. But in this case, the post-op pain I'm talking about is not for the patient, but for surgeons. Uh, because uh, I think we, a lot of, it will, as, uh, of us, as we uh, practice, uh, if we do not do it with proper exercise, stretching, and most importantly, doing it in the right neutral positions can su su suffer from significant uh, post-op pain, uh, particularly, I think, colorectal surgeons because of the number of platforms uh, that colorectal surgeons operate in. You've got open, laparoscopic, robotic, TAMIS, <clears throat> as well as uh, performing endoscopy. Uh, this is my disclosure slide. Uh, none of this is relevant to the material being presented today. <clears throat> Some additional disclosures. Uh, I'm a middle-aged surgeon who wears a seven, uh, size seven glove. And uh, historically, my back, shoulders, elbows, wrists, and knees would hurt <clears throat> or ache after a full day of laparoscopic cases. And I thought that sitting on a chair with my head on the console would help. But at the end of the day, I still get aches and pains in my back, ankles, and wrists after a full day of robotic cases. So uh, today, our goals are increase awareness and the practice of ergonomic principles in the operating room, uh, learn ergonomic positioning for various colorectal procedures, 
and also understand the importance of intra-op micro breaks and stretches. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, break down uh, the talk into four. Uh, we'll talk about definition and principles, followed by the significance of uh, ergonomics. And then I guess the meat of the matter, we'll talk about ergonomic setup, as well as the importance of intra-op micro breaks, and then end up with some take home points and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions uh, afterwards. <clears throat> so let's get started. What is ergonomics? It is the, uh, the study of human work and how it relates to our environment. Uh, and with the goal being that we want to reduce the incidence of work-related musculoskeletal disorders. A lot of you, when you started your work as a resident or a fellow, may have gotten some requirements uh, at your hospital about even how to set up uh, your workstation ergonomically. This is done at a lot of places. But surprisingly, uh, as physicians, we probably did not spend, uh, you know, we spent a majority of our time not in the work in, uh, with this as our workplace, but in the OR. And we don't get enough education or assistance with how to set up our workspace uh, in an ergonomic setup. But the principles remain the same. You want to keep the monitor at eye level or just below. Uh, and about two to three uh, feet away or about arm's length. You want to have minimal bend at the wrist when you're doing any type of uh, work. Keep your back straight, your elbows close to your body with some sort of support for your lower back. And keeping that hip at about 90 uh, degrees or slightly more, but not uh, flexed. And lastly, you don't want the seat uh, uh, of your chair pressing to the back of your knees with your feet flat on the ground. And if you think about it, this position is probably the same position you want to be when you're at the console doing a robotic procedure or when you're doing down, we're sitting down doing a TAMIS procedure. So this brings to, uh, to, uh, to front the uh, principles for ergonomics, which is working in ergon neutral positions to reduce ex excessive force and keeping things in reach. You want to work at the proper height and reduce excessive motion to minimize fatigue and static load. You want to minimize pressure points provide adequate clearance to be able to move, uh, and then also find time to exercise and stretch and make sure your work environment is comfortable. <clears throat> and the reason is that without ergonomics, surgery can be significant pain. Uh, in a mad analysis pro uh, uh, published by Stuckey in 2018 uh, in the Annals of Medicine and Surgery, uh, looking at 41 articles involving 5,100 surgeons, <clears throat> over two thirds uh, suffered from pain uh, during operating uh, with another significant number having fatigue and about 37% have, uh, experiencing numbness <clears throat> and stiffness with the involved uh, joints being the back, the neck, and the arms or shoulders. <clears throat> Mostly it is because the way we practice surgery violates the principles of ergonomics. Whether it's a consequence of surgical culture, the instruments that we use, which are not designed uh, for uh, surgeons, but designed for <clears throat> ease of proce processing. Uh, they were initially designed for bigger hands, the use of multiple adjuncts, such as headlights, loops, and aprons, the addition of digitation of non-operative uh, tasks, as well as workspace and time restrictions have all contributed to the increase in work-related musculoskeletal disorders. <clears throat> for those who are uh, uh, performing a lot of laparoscopy, and we'll also talk about robotic surgery in, in, in a bit. Uh, this survey uh, of gynecologic surgeons uh, published in 2016 showed that out of 100 surgeons, 77% uh, reported symptoms of their thumb, shoulders, wrists, fingers, and elbows. <clears throat> and particularly for, uh, for colorectal surgeons who uh, per uh, perform a significant number of endoscopies, uh, the study on uh, the entire GI team involving uh, the gastroenterologists, nurses, and technologists so experience significant uh, percentage of pain in their neck, lower back, hands, shoulders, and thumb, as well as their elbows and carpal tunnel syndrome uh, uh, in, a, in a significant manner. And so this just goes to show that, you know, every single procedure that uh, uh, colorectal surgeons are doing probably con contribute to additional ergonomic uh, challenges. Hmm. And even looking at uh, those who may opt not to perform endoscopy uh, in the future, uh, even just uh, it just show, goes to show how much of a uh, burden 
uh, endoscopy adds uh, to your practice. You can see here the significant difference in hand pain, back pain, leg pain, wrist pain of, uh, of a gastroenterologist perform endoscopy versus those who don't. Uh, so this just highlights that adding endoscopy to your armamentarium as colorectal surgeons also adds additional ergonomic strain uh, uh, to your body uh, with uh, no significant variables other than probably uh, accumulative years in practice uh, over time. <clears throat> in the OR, uh, operation-related muscle skeletal injuries uh, have resulted in uh, over 50% of uh, injuries in this survey uh, conduct, conducted by plastic surgeons. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, plaque published in the Plastic Reconstruction uh, Surgery Global Open uh, Journal. Uh, they looked at multiple specialties, including uh, general surgery, CT surgery, and colorectal surgery. And this showed that uh, uh, off practicing surgeons, uh, a lot, both on the male and female side, experienced uh, musculoskeletal injuries. However, what was interesting was that the uh, onset of injury was higher uh, at a lower age for female surgeons. As you look at this uh, graph, you see there that uh, in blue, the female prevalence of uh, musculoskeletal injury was higher uh, uh, at lower age groups and will probably affect uh, the uh, longevity of female versus uh, male surgeons uh, long term. Uh, so uh, I just briefly went over some of the uh, uh, issues uh, as well as the uh, principles and definition of ergonomics, and I will uh, transition to more significant things as to why this is important. Uh, uh, this uh, 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 illustration here shows just how interconnected surgical ergonomics is uh, with everything uh, that we do in surgery, whether it's productivity, career longevity, teaching, communication, teamwork, interrupt stress, uh, finances, uh, patient safety and quality of patient care, surgical ergonomics uh, somehow at one point or another will be affecting this uh, at various stages. In terms of quality of care, uh, again, the same paper from Stuckey showed that all about 30% of surgeons take their symptoms into account and this may result in a change to the procedure to reduce the pain of an operation, whether it was open or a minimally invasive uh, procedure. <clears throat> For trainees uh, who often work long hours under sleep deprived conditions and are usually the most junior person on the room with little to no input uh, on room setup, <clears throat> uh, having significant uh, issues with setting up the room uh, can then lead to more uh, injuries as trainees generate more force than necessary and move or maintain suboptimal biomechanical postures more frequently. And then once in the role of an operating surgeon, the position of the, either the operating room table uh, may not be, or the, uh, the monitors may not be optimized, may be optimized for the attending surgeon, creating additional physical and cognitive ergonomic stress for the trainee. And uh, more often than not, a lot of trainees are not aware of ergonomic principles. And the long-term significance of this is degenerative spine disease, rotator cuff pathology, degenerative lumbar spine disease and carpal tunnel syndrome, as well as a reduction in surgical workforce. Approximately 12% of the surgical workforce are expected to leave uh, practice as a result of uh, work-related musculoskeletal disorders, uh, leading to either practice restriction modification or early retirement. Now we get into the uh, meat of uh, this talk as to how can you set yourself up for success uh, ergonomically in the various procedures that you do. So one of the things we have at UCSF uh, is this safety checklist that we use uh, where we talk about uh, the surgeon gives her introductions, uh, goes over patient characteristics, and then anesthesia and uh, circulating nurse and the scrub person. Uh, also introduce themselves and talk about any questions or concerns. I think at this point, it's time to think about whether it is appropriate, and I do believe it is, to also talk about an ergonomics timeout in the OR. And when we talk about an ergonomics timeout, we talk about uh, things in our head, for example, the lights, the monitors, the loops, uh, and then for our torso, uh, these, is it the proper table height for the tallest person in the room? 
uh, how the cords are uh, thrown off the table so that they do not obstruct or cause injury, uh, making sure that we have proper attractors and instruments that are correct for our size hands, uh, and the use of anti-fatigue mats, uh, proper positioning of pedals, and the use of step tools. So let's go over some of these things uh, in greater detail. So for table height, it is very important to plan the height of the table based on the tallest person involved in the procedure, whether it be the scrub tech, the medical student, or the attending. Take into consideration size of the patient and use so locking step tools with anti-fatigue mats uh, when available. Uh, make sure overhead lights are positioned between members of the team to avoid head shadows, to avoid eye strain, as well as craning your neck to be able to visualize things better. And some of these recommendations are from the American College of Surgeons Division of Education and Surgical Ergonomics Committee. When choosing instruments, uh, use ones that lock to minimize grip fatigue, and as much as possible, use self-retaining retractors and powered tools or staplers when available. Think of working in a box when looking at your hands uh, and uh, elbows. Keep your wrists straight with elbows near 90 degrees. Your arm should not cross the midline and avoid twisting or reaching the end uh, or trying to avoid reaching the end of range of motion. Use body supports and avoid prolonged uh, sustained postures or static postures, particularly when retracting. As colorectal surgeons, you probably you, you uh, guys uh, wear a lot of things in your head, whether it be uh, loops, headlamps, or sometimes even a head-mounted camera, and all of these things add additional weight. Uh, you probably heard of the term cell phone neck, and if you apply the same principle to uh, uh, operating with each additional five to ten degrees of uh, forward flexion, you can see here that this puts a significant strain. Uh, on our necks in terms of the amount of weight that our cervical vertebrae are carrying. In addition, for those who uh, are wearing loops, uh, consider wearing a, uh, a loop with a declination angle so that this changes the, the flexion, degree of flexion of your neck, uh, as this can play an important role in developing significant uh, cervical neck disorders. The use of uh, step stools, ergonomic uh, anti-fatigue mats, and positioning your foot pedals on, an, on another step stool is very important to avoid having to uh, put additional strain on your legs because you are distributing uh, the weight of your feet uh, when operating. And then this is actually a very uh, interesting uh, and very uh, educational uh, uh, work uh, from the core curriculum for ergonomics and endoscopy by the ASGE uh, uh, group uh, led by uh, Kathy Walsh. Uh, we, uh, they talk about how to position uh, the, uh, the bed, the monitor, and the endoscopy tower uh, to minimize uh, long-term fatigue, especially for colonoscopies, uh, as this produces a significant strain in your body. Uh, making sure that the endoscopy tower and the monitor are in line so that there's minimal strain on your shoulders. Uh, some studies have shown that uh, women suffer more uh, carpal tunnel uh, and uh, finger uh, and wrist uh, soreness, while uh, uh, male uh, endoscopists suffer more back and neck pain, probably because of how uh, torque is being uh, achieved uh, during colonoscopy. Uh, looking at the height of the hospital bed. You want that uh, height of the bed to be about uh, uh, 10 centimeters uh, uh, below your, uh, your, uh, your elbow so that there is minimal uh, uh, excessive flexion or extension of the elbow. And uh, there now are scope holders so that when you're performing additional procedures, uh, that scope can be held, uh, the scope head can be held in place to uh, avoid uh, the additional strain that it causes by keeping it elevated. Uh, in terms of laparoscopic surgery, you want to avoid extreme flexion or extension of your shoulders, elbows, and wrists. Uh, you want to really keep your head over shoulders with your chin tucked about 15 to 20 degrees, uh, with the shoulders over your pelvis, with, hip at, uh, with your feet at hip width, and keeping your monitor about two and a half to three feet away with a 15 degree 
uh, gaze down. You want to lower that table height so that laparoscopic instruments are held uh, below shoulder height. And uh, these are the uh, uh, materials in your SCORE curriculum that were jointly produced with uh, the SSE. Uh, and the same principles apply to TAMIS. Uh, whether you are in a standing position, uh, you really want to maintain that uh, head at a neutral uh, position with about uh, 15 degrees uh, downward gaze, uh, keeping your monitor about three feet away, and adjusting the table height, uh, depending if you prefer to do this procedure sitting or standing, as is shown uh, in this diagram. Uh, you really want to avoid extreme flexion or extension of your shoulders, elbows, and wrists, and really lower the table height so your laparoscopic instruments are, again, held uh, below shoulder height. Uh, as we know, more and more procedures are now being done robotically. Uh, this uh, 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 illustration uh, from the uh, Mayo Clinic uh, produced by Sue Halbeck, who is now the president of SSE, uh, has been uh, very uh, helpful. This came from uh, uh, a interventional study of uh, uh, from JMIG uh, by Halbeck and Hockenstad, uh, just as to how to properly ad uh, adjust your console. And the important thing is you have to first have the proper chair. Uh, make sure adjust your hair to match your proper popliteal height, because this is really the start of everything. If you don't have the proper chair, you're going to have challenges at the console. So before you even sit down, raise the console uh, all the way up, rotate the console towards you as far as it can go, lower the armrest all the way down and retract the foot pedals away from you all the way into the tower. And then slide in with a proper chair, adjust it to your popliteal height, move the chair as close to the armrest as possible and raise it for, for clearance. Then sit up straight and lower and rotate the console until able to see through the viewfinder. Afterwards, keep your, hold the controls and keep your arms close to your sides, raise the armrest, and then place your foot uh, on the pedals and adjust the pedals as necessary. And again, the principles remain the same, keeping your uh, back flex uh, neutral if possible, but you can also uh, uh, lean forward uh, to a maximum of 15 degrees. Keep your head, uh, your elbow angle at about 90 to 120 degrees uh, to your shoulders. Keep your thigh uh, parallel to the floor and have minimal flexion of your foot when controlling your foot switch and keeping your feet on the floor to an angle of at least 90 degrees. You want to keep your stereo uh, viewing angle to less than 30%, for, uh, 30 degrees from the vertical and always be clutching, which is what I tell my residents, ABC, always be clutching and keeping your hands and wrists uh, neutral in a sweet spot. And this can really lead to significant lowering of the uh, soreness that you experience. Uh, as you can see in the smaller chart, uh, in, in an assessment of uh, surgeon physician, surgeon uh, physical uh, discomfort during robotic assisted surgery, 21% uh, experience neck discomfort, 20% experience finger discomfort, and a smattering of wrist, lower back, upper back, shoulders, and eye discomfort. So all of these things matter when you're setting yourself up on the console. Additional strategies, and this is why we were, I was asking earlier uh, at the very beginning, do any of you uh, uh, stretch your exercise before, uh, during, and after surgery? Uh, because warm-up exercises prior to surgery can improve performance and decrease strain. Uh, Interrupt microbakes, which we will uh, finish the stock with, uh, can, uh, and stretching can improve discomfort, uh, reduce eye fatigue, and improve surgical performance and regular exercise can decrease uh, the risk of injury, while strengthening exercises can help prevent pain and discomfort. Uh, very important to seek help when symptoms develop and being aware of your poor posture and actively correcting when recognized, AKA postural resets, and also adopting good posture outside the operating room, whether you're working on a computer, uh, using a tablet on a couch, or walking around while using your cell phone. So uh, last but not least, we'll talk about micro breaks. Uh, uh, micro breaks are very targeted uh, short physical breaks that are done uh, every 30 to 120 minutes uh, uh, in the middle of uh, surgery. Uh, surgeons are reminded to do this every now and then uh, uh, with a timer so that the stretches can be performed uh, in the sterile field uh, at or table. Uh, 
uh, and targeting the back and the neck for those that are shorter. Uh, this uh, two charts uh, show uh, two types of uh, stretches, one per being performed standing and the other one being performed seated. Those charts are available to be downloaded from the uh, Society of Surgical Ergonomics website. So uh, take home points, consider. Uh, uh, think about ergonomics of the entire team, uh, the surgeon, the assistants, the students, and the scrub tech or the scrub nurse. Uh, have situational awareness for all the peripherals involved during a case, including your overhead lights, your headgear, and your footgear. And proactively engage in uh, pre, intra, and post case stretching and micro breaks. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I just wanted to do a quick plug. Uh, please scan this QR code. Uh, we are doing a study right now uh, to understand the interplay between surgeon hand size and handling of surgical instruments. So please take a copy, take a photo of your hand uh, with a room care credit card uh, at, at the bottom of your risk uh, and upload it uh, to this website. And uh, these are some of the uh, links to help with uh, getting copies of some of the uh, materials that were included in the stock. Thank you so much to uh, Colorectal Surgery uh, Virtual Education Seminar Series and uh, looking forward to take any of your questions. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Soriano, for that talk. Um, just as a reminder to everybody uh, watching, if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, please feel free to post in our chat here or um, in the uh, Sir John chat, and we'll happy to filter those questions uh, uh, in for Dr. Soriano. It looks like um, Stevie J. Stapler's got one, which is earlier we mentioned having appropriate retractors or tools for hand size. Do any instruments for smaller hands come to mind? Um, and Stevie J is a smaller hand size herself, as am I. So definitely would like to know the answer to that. Yes, uh, Stevie, thanks for your question. So a lot of the instruments, as you all know, were designed uh, for when the average surgeon size hand was about seven and a half uh, glove or a seven glove. Uh, that is why having a powered instrument or a locking instrument is quite helpful. Uh, and uh, we are now actually, uh, the SSC is working with a couple of surgical companies in, in, in designing instruments that are more appropriate for surgeons with uh, hand or glove sizes smaller than a six. Uh, in addition, uh, it, it might be good to, to talk to your uh, uh, OR team and see if they have any sets that are specifically designed for uh, smaller hands because some of your attendings whether it be in general surgery or in other uh, fields may have requested for specific uh, instruments uh, that are made for, for smaller glove sizes, smaller hands. So they all actually already might have some instruments that you're not aware of that are specifically designed for smaller hands. So I think those are the two things that are important, you know, knowing what your hospital has. And then second is using powered and locking uh, instruments or uh, staplers. Awesome. There's another uh, question in here. Um, this is a tricky one. Sometimes it's hard to provide feedback to our attendings in the OR uh, regarding ergonomics. Are there any tips about how to approach this? Uh, so one of the things that uh, I think is important to discuss with the attending is uh, maybe ask them like, you know, how long they've been operating and have they always set things up the same way and have they experienced any kind of you know, back pain, uh, muscle aches, joint pains, and, and so on and so forth. So bringing up the topic of ergonomics, uh, I think uh, is one way to uh, discuss with the attending how setting up the room uh, in a way that benefits everyone uh, is one way to go about it. Uh, at, at UCSF, uh, uh, I gave grand rounds to the, uh, the Department of Surgery uh, and some of the other uh, attendings, for example, in plastic surgery and ENT have, have done something similar. Uh, see if you can identify a champion at your hospital or, or, or program, not necessarily in your department, uh, who, who may have given uh, talks on, on ergonomics, uh, and it might be in, inviting them to give grand rounds, uh, or anyone from SSE, for example, 
uh, to come and come and give grand rounds at your hospital or program might also be very beneficial to raise uh, importance uh, and awareness of this. Uh, the ACS has actually released a couple of bulletins on ergonomics. Uh, and so that might also increase their awareness of uh, the importance of how to properly set, set up a room so that the ergonomic benefits are experienced by everyone and there's no uh, discomfort uh, because of how the room is set up. Great. Um, got another one here. Thank you so much for this talk. This topic is crucial to our longevity, which I think we all can agree with. Um, do you know of any companies in specific that may be open to allowing trainees to try out newer or lighter or more ergonomic headlights, for example, as hospitals may not be willing to invest in purchasing these for trainees? Uh, so we are, uh, the SSC has a uh, committee that actually works with industry, uh, and we've been uh, helping them with designing, uh, at least for those who are open to redesigning some of their uh, instruments in, uh, to make this uh, more uh, user friendly or more user centric than uh, just thinking about uh, uh, designing an instrument without taking into account the number of users who might be affected by their design. Uh, I, can, I do not have specific companies uh, to name at the moment, uh, but uh, we are working with a couple of uh, companies within our society. And uh, I think more and more uh, surgical, uh, surgical device companies who attend, uh, whether it's ACS, Sages, uh, ASCARS, and other large society meetings are seeing the uh, the uh, benefits of redesigning uh, their their uh, their equipment uh, towards uh, geared towards uh, uh, a more ergonomic uh, design, especially for smaller gloves. And I think that is why that last uh, the second to the last slide or last slide showing uh, the uh, QR code uh, is going to be helpful in gathering data to prove and show these companies that, you know, the, the, the most common glove size now is not an eight glove uh, or a seven and a half glove, but we're probably closer now to six and a half or seven uh, because of the increased number of uh, females uh, or women in surgery, the increased number of uh, non-Caucasians uh, uh, in surgery. So we are seeing a, a increased number of uh, smaller glove sized uh, people in our uh, in our practice, whether and we're not just talking about surgery, we're talking about GYN, we're talking about ENT, uh, we're talking about the procedures. So all of uh, all of the practitioners in all these various fields have, are seeing more diverse uh, uh, population of, of, of practitioners. So it's very important to take into account all of these glove sizes in uh, developing uh, all these new devices. Awesome. I'm happy um, to put the QR code again. Yeah, um, perfect. Um, a couple other questions I've got here. Um, do you have any tips, tricks, or pointers for um, uh, ergonomic uh, uh, things we can do to be more ergonomic during endoscopy? Yeah, so, I, uh, I showed the, the slide earlier, and I'll go back to that. Uh, so here, again, it's very important that it starts with the bed that you're using, right? So if your hospital, if the, if the stretcher you're using uh, cannot go all the way down to such a point where your, your uh, elbow is at a neutral position, you need to use a step stool with an anti-fatigue mat. This is probably the single biggest investment that uh, your endoscopy suite should have uh, so that when you're standing there doing colonoscopies, doing interventional uh, colonos uh, endoscopy procedures, uh, multiple biopsies. And then the second one would be using a scope holder so that you don't have to keep that scope uh, uh, in your hand, holding that scope in, in a prolonged position resulting in uh, fatigue and uh, discomfort of your uh, your 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 left your left uh, elbow uh, and then the second would be de also decreasing your eye strain don't make sure make sure that monitor is not too far away uh, from you uh, and keep that in the proper height uh, most of the older endoscopy suites were designed uh, you know in a, a piecemeal fashion so 
uh, things might not be set up this way. Uh, but, uh, you know, to, to have a prolonged career and when you're looking at uh, places to take a job in, look at how they designed their endoscopy suite uh, and making sure that, you know, you're able to perform, you know, five or 10 uh, or however many colonoscopies, uh, you know, within uh, that time frame that you need in a way that, uh, you know, you're not beat up and tired at the end of the day. Uh, so, you know, set up your endoscopy tower in such a way so that that cord that holds your scope is not too far away because that puts added strain on your on your arm uh, and your shoulders. Uh, and uh, you know, you know, using uh, your 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 tip for torque steering, uh, and and see here how you have your your uh, wrist in a neutral manner when you're doing that. Uh, you know, so you're not uh, fatigued at the end of the day. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and that actually is a good segue into the, the last question I've got for you here, which is, um, as many of us are um, looking for jobs and engaging in contract negotiations and thinking about what to ask for our, you know, future employers, what's reasonable to, to talk about or ask about in terms of concessions or things that we should request um, up front to help with uh, improving our ergonomics before we get started? Yeah, I, I think uh, important to uh, have, for example, for headlights, having the lightest set of headlamps that you can use available. So it's not putting additional strain on your necks. Uh, and then uh, having ensuring that whether it's the endoscopy suite or the OR, having anti-fatigue mats and step stools available uh, because the adjustable height beds will be there. But if you don't have the anti-fatigue mats and step stools, uh, that might place an additional strain, especially on the, uh, the shorter uh, uh, surgeons uh, when you're setting up to do an open uh, or laparoscopic case. Uh, the towers, for the most part, uh, make sure that they are working properly. Uh, I have to admit that some of the places I've been to working, the towers do not, the monitors do not come down as high as, do not come down to my eye level. And so rather than what I do at that point, then is I actually elevate the bed and I put additional steps, even if I don't have to, just because I can't get the monitors down to be at the same uh, height as, as that I would want it to be when I'm operating. Uh, and this would probably be at older institutions. So you know, this all adds to career, career longevity as, uh, as Vanessa stated in her question. Uh, and so it is important that, uh, you know, when you're looking at, at new jobs to see, you know, how, how ergonomics is taken into account, you know, in the OR, uh, in, in the endoscopy suite, uh, and make sure that uh, some of the adjuncts that we mentioned here, uh, are already in place or that they will stock them and have them available, you know, whether it's powered staplers, uh, uh, powered instruments, uh, locking instruments. Some of the lap, uh, laparoscopic instruments might not be available there that are, are uh, that are rotating. So you want to make sure that the, the laparoscopic uh, instruments are also rotating because they will add a strain to your, to your operative, uh, uh, to, your, to your body as well when operating. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Soriano, for taking the time to talk with us. Um, this has been incredibly helpful, uh, practical uh, information for everybody. Um, please uh, tune in, everybody, next week at Sunday, 7 p.m., um, and visit our website at crsvirtualed.org um, if you're interested in looking up our upcoming talks. Thank you again, Dr. Soriano, and everybody for tuning in, and have a good night. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone.